they shoot a commercial wow. of five thousand dollars, and basically it's this kid, like a kind of a nerdy kid, standing in front of his locker, and this hot girl walks by, and he's like, "Whoa!" And he drops his books, and his papers go all over. Sure. And they're like, "Uh, oh, if you would have had the trapper keeper, that wouldn't have happened." Nerd. <laughs> so that's the commercial. Inspired by the adventures of our nurses, therapists, and techs, A Beer with Atlas is the only healthcare traveling, craft beer drinking podcast. Each week, we'll open a few beers, talk about the brewery and the style of beer, and then dive into some research curated specifically for each episode. In the end, we hope each one sounds like a conversation you'd have with your friends while enjoying a few cold ones. Welcome to another episode of A Beer with Atlas. I'm Rich. I'm Brian. And on the uh, on the controls, like usual, a little black box there, Mr. Producer Dolan. Or whoever you keep calling me. Yeah, whatever. That yeah, whatever nickname sticks what is this it? week. What is it? The guy you just looked up. Oh, Bob Vila? Bob Vila. Dolan fancies himself a woodworker now. He's, so a, he's a handyman. He didn't know who Bob Vila was when I called him that. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were going back to old pork chop sandwiches. Or, uh, oh, a hobo pork chop. Hobo pork chop. Oh, yeah. All right, Rusty Nail. Yeah. Yeah. Rusty Nail and... I don't remember yours, Brian. Uh, hop, I don't know. Hop father. Yeah, hop that father. sounds good. I yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, you know, speaking of things Dolan doesn't know about, uh, <laughs> we're heavy in that today. Oh, so right. Dolan's going to hopefully take notes, and he's going to learn quite a few things today. So this was Dolan's Christmas wish uh, about, when did you go? When did you go to the meadery here? Oh, man. Um, it will be a year in May. So this mead's been aging here. That's or, perfectly fine. Yeah, it seems That's funny. what you want. He went to this place called Big Lost Meadery in Gillette, Wyoming, and brought this bottle back for us. Nice. Um, it's called Wild Man. It looks like a wild man on the it label, does. too. It's mm-hmm. a good... I like their artwork. And I'll get into this. Let's open it. It's a screw top. Oh, I mean, that's the first time on this show we've had a screw top that's, alcohol that's container. That's 18%. Holy guacamole, as they say. So, yeah, someone's gonna need to drive to go get ta- tacos today. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna be us. I, I've had this, and Holy you know what? I'm, I'm gonna wait till we. You better just fill that cup up, there, Rich. I this think. Look, oh my gosh! Look at it pour. Y- you want to stop there? Yeah, you definitely want to stop <laughs> there. You, you don't want to go <laughs> too deep in this. It, yeah, it almost looks like straight, like straight vodka. How am I, I supposed mean, to audit later? Well, um, that's a good question. Yeah, it's not going to be happy with. She don't have to know. Okay. There we go. Wow. Yep. That's definitely me. Yep. This smells alcohol y. Oh, it is. It's going to taste it too. But not in a bad Bernie way, I'm guessing. Okay. All right. So, Big Lost Meadery uh, is located 106 South. Whoa. You you okay there? He already. Yeah. Just smelling it got him a little little tipsy. 106 South Gillette Ave in Gillette, Wyoming. Open uh, Wednesday through Friday, 4 to 10. Saturday, 11 to 11. Sunday through Thursday, they're closed. Probably because they're so heavily intoxicated from the four days that they're open, they need three days to recover. Yeah, it's either that or they're small mom and popper. Mm, that's, that's true. my guess. Yeah. You actually, you went to this place? Yeah. So, um, I'm, I'm, what do you want to know? Do you want to know the atmosphere? Yeah. Okay. Is it like, just like a uh, tap room, like a brewery tap room? You, they do. They have some beers on tap. Um, mm. So, so I mean, they do make their own beers. But uh, their their whole thing is Viking themed. Viking themed. See, I have a, a one of my really good friends. His name's John Miller. We used to be in a band together. And he makes meat at, at home as well. Mm. And he has, he's a nerd, and he'll be proud to tell you that he has his own drinking horn <laughs> that he has for such occasions like uh game of thrones episodes or uh the vikings tv show so he breaks that out on special mead drinking occasions and Mm. he has his own horn so so if you order just the mead if you don't do a flight you get it in a horn hell yeah big loss yes that's amazing yes and you can also buy the horn so you can always bring it back and and i I don't know if there's a discount with it Hmm. but that's that's a piece of glassware i don't have that i need is a horn is a horn and uh the the cool thing about the place too is they have a uh, wood fire um so we went in the beginning of may uh because my sister is graduating high school so in wyoming it's still snowing it's still cold yeah and uh, so they had the wood fire going, and mm. and you just walk in, 
and the place is all just old, you know, downtown buildings, uh-huh. old yeah. wood, uh, very, very thick wood. And then yeah. it just, just, it's smoky in there because of the yeah. fire. Oh man, that sounds amazing. It's so, Dude. so lax. And then of course they have a, a bunch of different meads. I think they have three on tap and then the fourth is their seasonal. I mean, just holding this would give you a buzz and then you got the <laughs> fireplace going. You That'd be like an instant nap. I'll it, tell you, it burns my nose just to smell it. Oh, I, I had wait. the flight, yeah, and I, it was good enough for me. You went flying, yes, I bet. yes. I wish I, when I graduated high school, I got to go to a meadery for my party. <laughs> that sounds amazing. No I didn't take my sister. Oh, okay. I was just checking. <laughs> hey, are we gonna do this? Let's turn. Oh, let, yeah. Hey, have you ever had a mead? No, never. Oh, uh, no, I have never had a mead before. Oh, smokes. History. Here yeah. we go. Never had a. Do you like you like sweet wine? Yeah. Oh, you're going to like this. Yeah. All right. All right. Here we go. Mead. Oh, it tastes like honey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite thing. It tastes like Bernie honey. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. I mean, can you taste why you get messed up? Heck yeah. Uh This is 18% all day long. This is um, different from what I remember. It it must be the aging. I don't know. It Mm. aged a year in here. That's good. I feel like I get a lot more honey. When I was there, it was was a lot stronger. For sure. Mm. And you also had the option to get it warm. I didn't know that was a thing. But yeah, Mm. you can warm it up. Interesting. Hmm. I've never heard I've never heard of that, but so hmm. a few years ago in Bellevue we had a meadery and it was called Moonstuck Moonstruck Meadery. I remember this. And it was phenomenal. And okay. that's me and my friend John would go there and a couple of our mm-hmm. friends and um they had Was Cher did Cher work there? Um she snapped out of it mm. and did not work there good anymore. Call. Uh, good but call. they made a pizza. They made pizza there. Oh. And that was really good. Um they had like eight or ten different flavors. And they had, um, this is what you would consider to be um, a still version of a mead, which means it's not carbonated. Okay. There's no bubbles or anything like that. Um, and we'll get into all that sort of jazz here in a little bit. But um, this is reminiscent to one of their just straight meads. Um, this tastes like it has, that said it had hops in it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no bitterness like no, at all. Like no. it's sweet. I mean, it's like a sweet white sort of fruit wine is what it tastes like to me and it's and it's very honey heavy but that's kind of the idea i'm gonna have another little sip of this and then i'm gonna let you do your thing and i'll get it in mine you know it just it's interesting because i was just i was just picking up my phone to do the untapped is are there meads on yeah yeah it should be yeah it's just it's so drastically different i think than anything i've had before oh it's just like straight honey it is it's it's like uh, yeah it's like if a wine were made with hops, I guess. But yeah, it reminds this. Are you a Simpson? You're a Simpsons fan, yeah, yes. Yeah. When uh, they, when they parodied the um, uh, uh, Lord of the Flies, mm-hmm. when they got stuck on it. Remember, yeah. Otto drove them on. The, oh yeah, yeah. And uh, and Ralph comes out and he's got berries all over his oh, face, yeah. and he goes, "These berries taste like burning." Uh huh. That this this beer tastes like burning. I was hoping you weren't going with the tobacco. <laughs> so we'll take burning berries. The tobacco episode arguably could be one of the uh, best yeah, of all time. So good. Um, so here's what I got for us. I got a little history lesson. And it kind of hits it on the thing over there that talks about the different, um, like, uh, I think China, the Vikings, all sorts of people made that. Yeah, you can read it if you want. There's uh, a whole story. Before you get it, there's a yeah. whole story on their website, like, of the wild man. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Go read it. It's the craziest kind of. Is it, it like a big man or a bigfoot sort of thing, or kind it's of. like a crazy mountain guy that went nuts? And yep, yep, that yeah. sounds right. That's like a, a uh, an ur- not an urban legend, but just like a tall tale from the west that is in a lot oh, of different wow. places. Yeah. That it's a, a guy that just like was out in the wilderness too long and just went nuts. No, that's. Well, yeah. I do know that each one of their meads has a character. Like uh, the honey with rosé is called the crazy woman. Or I saw that mm. one too. That yeah. one was really good. I that one didn't make it back. Sorry. Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> one of those deals. Oh. Yeah. Um, but on the bottle it says, uh, "Get meducated," and it says, "Mead is the world's oldest fermented beverage made from honey." 
Mead was a favorite of the ancient Egyptians, Chinese, Vikings, Saxons, and just about every other culture that loved to party down and get their pillage on. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Higher in alcoholic content than beer or wine, our meads are flavorful, mellow, and perfectly suited for sipping with a damsel by candlelight or knocking back from a ram's horn before sacking the nearest nunnery. There you go. (laughs) So go get lost in a good mead. You definitely want to sip this. Yeah, yes. like you don't want to do a beer. I was, I'm watching your glass. I was, I want to see how it goes. I definitely need to slow it down. You do bit. need to slow it down. Plus, I have a ton of of uh, information All to right. share. Um, the thing I think is interesting about mead is, well, I said I, a little bit of my research was um, the oldest evidence they have is 15,000 BC. Good lord! And I don't think I've used this term on this podcast. Some other people have, okay. but. Mead is just a great thing if you want to just get fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> the ABV is so strong. Yes. 18%. And that's on purpose. So people 15,000 BC were like, you know what I need? I need to get real messed up in the cave tonight. Yes. <laughs> and that's how they would do it. And well, it, the, the way to make it, I mean, it's been modernized a little, but the, the idea of it has not changed in that long stretch of time. So I, I assume you're going to talk through the process because, I mean, yeah. I understand I, I understand the basics of brewing beer, not uh-huh. that I really want to do it, right. but I also understand once you get to a certain ABV, the, it's, the yeast starts dying off. Yeah, true. So how do they do this? Well, let's just walk through the process. Okay. And then uh, we'll talk about some other extracurriculars tied to it but Mm -hmm. basically what you're doing is i want to get my numbers right because i've i've seen my brother-in-law make this but i've never actually made it with him before it's um let's see one to two pounds of honey per gallon of water that's your ratio whoa that's a lot of honey. that seems like a lot of honey it is a lot of honey that's why it's very expensive to make this Mm -hmm. it's also very expensive to buy it one of the problems I think that happened with the meadery in here in Nebraska mm-hmm. was a bottle of mead is like eighteen to twenty two dollars. Mm. Whereas people, if you're going to the you know cross train or wherever you can get a crowler or mm-hmm. you know some bombers to go, yeah, uh, you're not looking at twenty 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 five no. dollars. Right. Um, but so that's the that's one of the issues. It's it's expensive to make it. Dolan spent like a month's salary on this. Yes, thing. he did. <laughs> it was it was like I, I want to say it was like twenty eight dollars. Yeah, twenty eight dollars. Yeah. Wow. But this is something. This is one of those things. Um, if that price scares you, this is something you could share with six, eight, ten people and sure and have a good time. Um, so basically, the process of it is you've got all that honey, and I only know this as a homebrew way. So this is the way I can explain it. I don't know how they would. I'd probably do it the same way at this place, just in a bigger scale. But basically what you do is you've got your honey, your amount. Most of the time, homebrew folks um, are making them in five-gallon batches just like you do with beer because okay. you're using your same equipment. Mm-hmm. Um, you want to get the water, your boil, basically. Yeah. You don't. You want it to get to be about 140, 150 degrees. That's where you're going. You're not looking for it to be as hot as you do for a beer mm-hmm. um, because you're going to get that water warm, or we'll just call it hot. Mm-hmm. You're going to get it to that 140, 150 temperature. Then you take it off that heat, and that's when you add the honey. Okay. The honey is instantly going to go to the bottom. And if you don't take it off your burner, um, it'll scorch the bottom of your pan even with all the water. It's just just too hot. So um, you have to take it off the heat. You add the honey. Yep. You let it sit for a couple minutes. You stir it up, and then you add it into like a plastic container that's got cool or colder water in it. Okay. So you're trying to cool it down, basically. So you've got it warm. It changes the consistency of the honey. That sits for a little bit. Then you add that warm water and honey combination, which is called a must, M-U-S-T. Okay. You add that into the colder water version, and then that sits there for a little bit. Okay. And then you, um, let's see, you do your, you know, it takes some time. It just kind of, you have to cool it down. You have to get it to about 65 to 75 degrees. Mm -hmm. That's where you're looking for. Okay. Um, and which takes a couple, usually you can do it in like a cold water bath like you would do with, uh, with a beer. So you'll do, usually you'll see like a, you'll see a copper coil. You ever seen that with beer making or yes. like moonshine mm-hmm. stills? That's where you run your cold water through. 
So your st- your stuff is sitting in the middle of this, and it's just pumping cold water around uh, it to cool it down. Understood. So you're not actually adding water, really, to mm-hmm. the most part. You're just cooling it off. Cooling it off. And a lot of times in the summer, if you're using making beer outside or whatever, you just use your garden hose and run cold water through that spring mm-hmm. or that coil, and then that cools off the stuff that you're you're making. Okay. So you do that. That's the time where you... This one didn't, but this one does. Um, add your fruit. If you want to have a fruited mead, Mm -hmm. um, then you add your puree or whatever sort of stuff you're going to add. Your ingredients, your hops, you can do it then too. And then you pitch the yeast, which we're familiar with with beer, right? Right. But usually you do that right after the boil, that sort of stuff. So this is very similar to the beer making process then. It's almost exactly the same, except that you're not really cooking anything Mm -hmm. over the fire. Mm -hmm. You start the water warm and then it kind of goes down from there. You You slow cooker in it. Kind of. You just don't want it to get as hot because it mm. just de- destroys the honey. Mm. So then it sits and cool it off. You pitch the yeast and then you put it into your um, carboy, like a like a glass one with an airlock, like you've seen, uh, yes. you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, you stir that. when Once you've added your yeast, you stir that twice a day for two minutes. So you're just kind of activating the yeast mm-hmm. basically, right? Mm-hmm. So then once you know it's it's started you'll get your bubbles and your airlock and all that stuff once you know that's done then that's when you move it and you can start the process um of like just letting it sit for a while okay so once you know it's done with the yeast it sits for two to three months it just sits there you don't touch it really it just sits and then after that time you can do a couple different things but mostly what you do um is you're going to bottle it after that two to three month okay. wait time because that's what's letting that alcohol happen and that's where your ABV is coming from, that sort of stuff. And the flavor will change and, you know, some the alcohol burn will mute. Um, I'm guessing why you say it tastes different now is because it sat in that bottle for a year versus just getting it off the tap, which was probably two to three months old. Yeah, it's definitely a lot less... Um liquor burning yeah it's it's more honey when i first had it right out of the the tap it was um it was almost like i was sipping a, a liquor mm-hmm. um but now it's 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 a little bit more enjoyable now actually i think good well yeah. that's kind of the, i mean that's where you're at with abv you're getting you're approaching alcohol like hard alcohol so you bottle it and you can bottle it Usually, like you see with this one or like mm-hmm. that one, wine bottle size or something. You don't usually yep. do small ones. Um, and then you let that sit. If you can, you want it to sit for six months to another year no. just to mellow out. So we did, we did this on purpose then. Yes. Oh, perfect. So that's really, that's the entire process. Now, once you, before you bottle it, if you, you taste it before you bottle it, and if it's not sweet enough for you, mm-hmm. you can do something that's called back sweetening, which is like just basically adding more honey to okay. the process to make it sweeter to your taste that will reactivate some yeast stuff again. Right. And then you have, you run the risk of having some issues with that, but you have to like basically melt down the honey again. Like you did previously. You don't just dump it in. That was my question yeah. is you have to, you have to kind of yeah. reprocess, so to speak, right. that honey. And it's kind of a pain. Um, mm. So most times, at least for homebrewers that I know, if it's, they don't do that second process again because hmm. you're basically getting everything out again three months mm-hmm. later to add a little bit of m- what may or may not even change the flavor of your your hmm. drink. Yeah. So, um, but then you bottle it and you let it sit for as you know as much as you want. It's one of those things like you could age this. This could sit there for five, ten years, and you'd probably be fine hmm. as long as you bought you know closed the bottle up correctly and stuff. Sure. So, um, and that's really the process, which is why it's been able to be done. For 15,000, 17,000 years, you know? Right. Because it doesn't take a lot of ingredients. Hmm. Um, it doesn't take a lot of equipment special. I mean, it. you can do it. Most homebrewers use their same stuff. Um, but my friend John that makes it, he doesn't have any homebrew set up. He just makes it on the stove and yeah. does his own thing. So Interesting. There's lots of different ways to do it, but that's basically, basically it. Huh. Now, okay. there's different kinds. This is what we would call traditional because it doesn't have any fruit. Mm-hmm. It's clear. You can see through it. It just tastes like honey, basically, right? And that's yeah. kind of what we're getting. Delicious are, burning honey. There are some hopped ones. This one has hops in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the one in the Bellevue place used to have a hopped one that was pretty good. Um, but then you'll see something. You'll see one called Hydromel, which is like 
a watered down mead, so less thick when you pour. See how like on your glass it kind of just hangs out there, almost it, like cough medicine. It has legs like a wine. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. So a um, uh, hydromel will be a little bit more watery, and it won't do that as much, and it'll also be weaker. Then there's something that's called uh, I want to say this right, methylgin, which is like spiced with herbs. Like an older traditional f- flavor, basically. Mm. So you'll get different. They can almost be savory at times. And then there's another one that's basically just sweet. Um, and that's a mellow mel, which is a fruit one, which mm. is what this thing's going to do. You keep alluding to the bonus mead. We have a bonus mead. So we have one that has fruit, and then we have one that does not. Bonus, so bonus mead. a mellow mel is, is a fruit one, and they're usually the most popular ones is a sizer which is made with apples or apple juice. Mm. Oh, that would be good. Yeah. Or um, there's one called a piment, which is grape, which is closer to a wine. Oh. Uh, but I've seen them with mm. like blueberry, boysenberry, aronia berry. Uh, that's what we have in this one. Um, raspberry, any sort of fruit you can make a meat out of. Pear, Yeah, there was, there was four of them at this big lost that uh, mm. when I went there. And, and their seasonal for the spring was the blueberry. Um, but there are three main ones that they always have is the original, the, the wild man, then the crazy woman, which is the same as the wild man, just rosé. They add it's pink. Mm. Um, and then their, uh, other one is orange. Mm. Yeah. Um, but it, it's pretty much, they were all the same. My favorite was, uh, was honestly this one and the, and the rosé one it was easy. Mm. So that's kind of, that's just the rundown. I mean, you can get real technical and whatnot if you wanted to, but that's basically the process. It's very similar to brewing, other than just the temperatures and your times, and you're waiting mm-hmm. a lot longer to drink it. In, in theory, usually with you know the beer, it's what six weeks, eight yeah. weeks, yeah. and yeah. then it's ready to go. Depends on the style, but yes. Yeah, and then this one, it's more like six months to a year is yeah. is optimal. And that's the other thing about meteries. It takes a lot to start them up, right? Because you can't serve on your first day open. Right. You have to have prepped ahead of time, like a year. Right, you're open for a year before you can make a single dollar because no one can try your stuff. Do they? Well, they have the same dilemma as like as breweries, right? I mean, you can't until you have your business license, you can't you can't produce for sale, right? But so it's kind of a catch twenty two. Yeah, interesting. So that's a, another loophole, and because it's so strong, it's it's usually treated as a spirit oh. and not like a like a brewery or a beer, huh. uh, because you know you're talking a glass of that is worth three strong beers. Yeah. Um, so it's it's kind of looked at a little bit differently as far as liquor licenses and hmm. just you know you got to be careful with mead for sure. Yeah. It's easy to drink. It's just it is really easy to drink it's, and it's kind of scary easy. Yeah. 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 So uh, at uh, Kincader, you know that I do. They have that jalapeno beer mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. the devil's gap the, yes yes they so, do a raspberry version too mm-hmm. they do a raspberry version and you know why they do a raspberry version i think mm-hmm. i was out there out uh where old lahorn's from yeah out at the actual brewery mm-hmm. and they were partners with the meadery um in bellevue oh and what they would do is they would take their raspberry mead you get a whole bottle of it mm-hmm. and you would then pour in two of the devil's gaps and mix them oh so you got the spice of the jalapeno and the raspberry from the mead and the beer. And it basically tasted like if you've ever had like pepper jelly, like with cream oh, cheese or something. Yes. That's basically what it was. So for a long time when I would buy the mead, that's what I would do. I'd get that beer, I'd get the mead and combine it at home and I would do it. But they had it at the, at the brewery. They had it on like tap basically. Mm, yeah. So they would do that for you. And uh, that's one of the big things I miss about that meadery was doing that sort of combination. So mm. if you ever find... You can buy, I think in Nebraska, there's a brand called Chaucer's. You'll see it in in the kind of almost like the liquor section of the grocery store. Like okay. Hy-Vee carries it. It's in a long, skinny bottle like this. It has a, well, it looks like a knight from a Chaucer's story. Huh. Um, but they make different flavored ones. If you ever come across like a strawberry or a raspberry one, uh, get it and mix it with like a spicy sort of beer. And it's amazing. Mm. You got the sweet and the heat and it's just great. All right. I know what I'm doing this weekend. Yeah, there you go. So that's what I got for you is just the process. Interesting. But they're like Dolan said, like there's only one of these in Wyoming. Mm-hmm. Um, there aren't any in Nebraska that I know of now because the one that was closed, it was a homebrew guy that made this on the side Yep. and he would enter it in contests and competitions and he won a bunch. He like won, 
he won a huge one in Europe, and it was like big enough that he was like, okay, I should probably do this for like my money. Right. And it was open for a couple, two, three years. They they were open and um, did um, distribution all around the state. Yeah. And uh, finally, it was just so expensive. Honey is expensive. Yes. And then if you want to get even like technical into it, you know how we have different IPAs with different hops, and everyone's looking mm-hmm. for something new. Well, that's the same thing with honey, and honey changes flavor where you're at. Right. So, like, you've heard the term Tupelo honey. Mm -hmm. Um, That tastes very different than some other kinds of honey. And Tupelo honey is very expensive. Um, But home brewers, like my brother-in-law, that's the kind of stuff. They'll do a big buy of it with his homebrew club in Lincoln. They'll go in and buy, like, 50 gallons of honey or whatever, like, to get some sort of price. And then they all, whoever wants to come get some, they buy it, and they all make their own mead batches. Interesting. That's cool that uh, you brought up that the different flavors of honey, wherever it comes from. Uh, Rich and I were just talking about that the other day, mm-hmm. where Rich knows a guy that um, had bees next to his jalapeno plants. Yeah. Oh, right? wow, and then cool. He was able to actually get that honey on the on the Scoville scale. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. That'd be cool to make mead some. For sure. From, you could make a really good yeah, one with that. Yeah, really good mead. Is that like a local person? Yeah. Oh, yeah. nice. And it was, yeah, it was super interesting to hear him talk about it, too, because it, it all depends, like, where he would set those. Mm-hmm. And he couldn't figure out, okay, why all of a sudden is there some sort of heat to this one yeah. or whatever? And then he realized, oh, they're really close to my Jalapenos. jalapeno That's plant. so cool. Right. Yeah. It was so, it's so crazy. But it's neat because it just something so natural in nature it affects the end product so much. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I learned about just doing a little bit of research on this was sometimes you'll see honey, if you've kept it in your house for a long time, mm-hmm. almost crystallizes. Yes. And, and like, usually people think that's bad. Yeah. And no. that's opposite. Like, that's the best version of it that you should have. And a lot of um, meteries will use that. They'll look for that specifically. You don't want to go to the store and see through your honey. Mm. So that a place like this would not want to use that sort of clear um, commercialized stuff. They want, they want it chunky and almost like rock that's where all the flavor is so that's that's another thing i learned i've definitely thrown honey away that i was like oh what the hell why is this <laughs> like a rock in here but that's right. allegedly you can just scoop it out and spread it and it's well, supposed to be so it's good cool good. tip you can um if the if you take the label off the jar you don't even have to do that if you don't want to but drop that jar into a, a small pot of um like boiling water and it'll go back to normal um, so it, you're basically still really good. starting the process of back sweetening mead right yeah. there. Right, exactly. Hmm, interesting. Weird. What do you got? Anything extra? So it kind of plays into how these dudes got their start. It, interesting okay. how, how it kind of, it, it, I, I suppose there's a patience level here that I just don't have, right? I don't have enough patience to brew beer. Yeah, I don't either. That's why I don't. Right, and, and exactly. Well, that and the attention to detail and the cleanliness uh, it's not, science, man. I, I don't like biology, chemistry. I don't <laughs> none of that. Have no you, thanks. Have you been back in Bobby's like chemistry? In this chemistry, lab yeah. Uh-huh. That he has back there, like every yeah, brewery, with the beakers has. and the microscopes, yes. and every good brewery has like a biochemist on staff. Yes, to like watch their yeast strains and stuff. Unbelievable, like yeah. science process. And not that I'm not a clean person. Like I like my things yeah. clean. But that's another level when you're whole sanitizing level. every single thing you touch and, all the yeah. time, uh-huh. all the time. Yeah. So you, kind of the story of this meadery begins in like 2007 in, in Utah. Oh. Uh, Sam Kleik, Kleikman and his friend Ned Vashholes. They can't have easy last name. No, of course not. Let's call them Sam and Ned. That sounds good. Sam and Ned decided to start brewing beer in a forest service cabin in the middle of nowhere. So mm. two dudes in the middle of nowhere started brewing their own beer. Sounds like it was a secret deal. Kind of. Maybe. Well, it's Utah. Yeah. So may, yeah. maybe it was I mean, Utah game. still, I don't know if they've changed recently. Maybe they changed recently, but they had those crazy liquor laws, yeah. like 3-2 and all that stuff. So maybe they had to do maybe it. They but you can't, you can't want the bartender, when they make drinks in Utah, they actually have to go behind a curtain and make it. You can't Which watch them. Which is so them. weird. You can't watch <sighs> them make the drink. Yeah. So weird. Tease me. <laughs> I know, right? Weird. That might be why, right? Yeah. I mean, hmm. Yeah. Weird. That is weird. Uh, 2009 was when Sam tried to make uh, mead for the first time. Uh, his friend, uh, Shane Anderson, who has a normal last spelling of his last name, uh, hooked him up with some honey uh, in from Montana. He got 125 pounds of honey to try his first batch. And he was super, at first he was like, wait a minute. I'm not going to do this. Like, it's, yeah. one, the process takes too long. Two, it's too expensive. 
And yeah. if it comes out bad, then I've just wasted all this time or That's whatever. That's totally true. Yeah. Yeah. And one of his friends convinced him, like, no, you probably should try this. Like, I bet it's going to be good if you do it mm-hmm. or whatever. So he did it for the first time. A year later, uh, the mead was done, and it was amazing. So that's kind of how the, the, this this meadery started. Uh, 2014 was kind of when Big Lost was born. Uh, 2017, so three years later, they kind of get they get their start there mm, in, yeah. in Gillette. Um, a Sam took on a partner, Bob uh, Hewitt Gafferney, uh, who was, uh, d- if I remember the story right, he was dating. Bob was dating Sam's sister. And they okay. kind of got along, and it was one of those things like, hey, just go hang out with my oh, brother yeah. okay. or whatever. And then Bob ended up buying in, and nice. they, they quit their full-time jobs. Ooh. One was a firefighter, and the other, I can't remember what the other one did. Yeah. And they started Big Lost, and that's kind of just where it started from. So those are the wow. two dudes, Sam and Bob now, that uh, they run the, the meadery there in Gillette. I just, you know, hats off to people that can do that. Because I would think a firefighter, yeah. you're talking about a pension, you're talking about right. good money, mu- like... A good living, yep. you know, and to give that up to try this, oh man, that takes stones. I don't have. Yep. So that's kind of that's that's where the whole thing. So I mean, in in the grand scheme of things, it took them uh, 2007 to 2017, right? So it took ten them ten years, years to actually get it off the ground from from the day he thought I'm going to brew beer for the first time in the middle of nowhere in Utah to yeah. I can produce this mead and we can make some money on now, it. How did they end up in Wyoming? They moved. He moved just there. Moved there. He just okay. moved there. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. coal probably could be. <laughs> mm, yeah. That or the better, better uh, liquor laws and distribution. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. That it, makes sense. Isn't it always the story? Is always two dudes that met because their wives pushed them together. <laughs> yeah, that's and just go <laughs> yeah. whatever. It's a good and, way to make friends, I right? guess. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> you spend a lot of time together. Brew some beer. Make some mead. Whatever I mean, it is. So. Like when you. When you make a beer batch or whatever, and you've probably been around for this, mm-hmm. there's a lot of sitting around and waiting. Yep. So there's a lot of time to talk and get to know people. It's yep. kind of fun. Yeah. I like it. And a lot of drinking other beer while you're yep. doing it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so you can't be around it and not drink more of it or drink others, mm-hmm. you know, other beers yeah. or whatever. You have, so. Yeah. You can't drink water while you're making beer. It no. Work. I, I think that's what's what I've kind of gleaned from all this so far is if you like wine mm-hmm. or if you've enjoyed a uh a stronger cocktail sure you would like this if you like a sweet wine like mm-hmm. a nebraska midwest wine yep. you know like mm-hmm. that's kind of what all we have is because we have the fruit trees that we have right if you like that style you'll love meads mm-hmm. like this is an easy stepping stone i think and it's less dry than than a wine it finishes way sweeter Tacos are going to taste so good. Oh, man, they are. Holy cow. <laughs> Dolan, this is tasting good. I might go back for just a little bit more. I, I was cautious with my pour. so I was, too. I poured really small, and I was not, and we're gone, and, and he still has a little bit. So <laughs> I was not. We might do that. So um, when this came up, and I thought this topic, I had two topics in mind to cover okay. that are kind of related. And then this third one popped into my my mind this morning, and I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this. Because you and I will know this, mm-hmm. and Dolan will probably not. Okay. But that's okay. <laughs> um, Mead. The name Mead. Okay. M-E-A-D. The company. Yep. Oh, You yes. know what they made? Uh, yes. Yeah. The tra- Mead Trapper Keeper. Uh-huh. That's where we're going. Oh, sweet. Because I always wanted one, and I didn't have one. Trapper Keeper. Yeah. You See, heard of Dolan these? has no idea. Oh, my goodness. Dude, your, your You're social about to get status schooled. in school was strictly based on your trapper keeper. You lived and died by what design oh, was on your trapper keeper. Man. Is that like a like a book bag, like on a satchel book bag? Mm, you're close. You're kind yeah, it we're went getting there. In your satchel when book When you actually bag. when it breaks it when oh. I'll break it down for you, it you're just like, What? Yes. Why was this popular? I but, know what you're talking about. But the, for some reason the plastic with the little like it had the the elastic and you would wrap it around the button or something to no. keep it shut? No. no? no. You're close, but you're, no. You're getting closer. Okay. You're getting warmer. All right. All right. Here's warmer. where we're going. All right. Uh, 1978, the first Trapper Keeper came out. Wow. And basically what they are, at least at that time, was colored three-ring binder. That's basically what it is. Yeah. Yeah. A three-ring binder. It, Does it that is, sound exciting to it you? It is most yeah, basic form, you, yes. You can... The three wing ring binder, it like, like I remember them. You can zip them all the way around, 
or it, if you didn't have a zipper, you had a little elastic thing, and it would. Yeah, that's probably. I mean, yeah, it's kind of the same idea, but it's that was not a trap. Okay. Keeper. No, okay. No. So basically, what we've got here, uh, it is, and this is crazy to me, in the prime, so eighties to mm-hmm. early nineties. Oh yeah. A hundred million dollars a year. Gosh. Made on trapper keepers. What I tell you. you your social status, like your your hierarchy uh-huh. in, in the popularity of <laughs> yeah. school, depended on yes. the coolness of your trapper keeper. Seventy five million sold as of twenty seventeen. They still make them. You can still get one. Oh. They're hard to find. Not like you used to be able to just walk in and get one, but you can get one. They're still out there. So in nineteen seventy two, the guy that invented this or created it, he was working for Mead, and he was in charge of their product development. Right. Okay. He did something really cool, I think. And it's kind of tied to baseball. He almost used sabermetrics, but in a way for business. Okay. So he went to this Harvard professor that like studied schools. And he was basically like, what's going to happen in the next 10 years? What, what do you forecast the changes to be? Um, he, knew, he had an idea of things he wanted to work on was like organization. That was his idea for pr- new products. Something okay. about keeping people organized. And the professor at Harvard in 72 said, well... There's going to be more kids per class. They're going to be taking more classes, and they're going to have a lot smaller lockers. They're not going to have as much space to keep all their things, and they're going to be going to more places. All of these things became true. Yes. Yes. And that's kind of where the idea comes from. He's like, okay, well, if they're going to be going places, they're going to have more stuff, but they have less place to put it, then I want to make something that keeps it all together. And that's what he did. Genius. So the first idea was, a f- they called it a peachy. Terrible name. That's a terrible name. Peachy Keen is short for. Oh, okay. And it's mm-hmm. a, it's the folder that mm-hmm. goes inside your Trapper Keeper. Okay. They've been around since the 1940s, but they were only to the the West Coast to the Rocky Mountains. Oh. And this is why they had the basically the pocket mm-hmm. was up and down and not horizontal. It was oh. vertical. Oh. So your paper stayed in like a piece of paper. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was a design that, let some for some reason, was cool in the West Coast and never made it across the country. Weird. Um, and it wasn't until this guy who came up with the idea was talking to his sales rep in the West Coast, and he was like, "Hey, you know, I here's the design I have for these sh- these folders that will fit in this binder." And the guy's like, "Well, why don't you make it so that the pocket is vertical?" Right. And he's like, "Well, why? Why would I do that?" And he's like, "Well, that way, if you dump you put upside down, the paper doesn't fall out." Mm-hmm. And he was like, oh, that's a, that's a good idea. Yeah. And that's what they did. So they made about seven or eight different versions before they actually released one. They had it for a while. The pockets were angled on the folder. Mm-hmm. so almost like a diagonal. I remember those. So that was a, a, an option you could get. Mm-hmm. That was my option, actually. I, I preferred to that one. Um, let's see. I couldn't oh. tell you why, but it just did. The name. I thought this was great. This ties in kind of what we're doing. So the guy has the, the idea. He's got... Um, the design, he's got it all fairly worked out, but he's like, what should we call this? And his boss, they go out for lunch, and they have some martinis, as you do in 1976 or whatever. Mad Men style. At lunch, yeah. And he's sure. like, let's call the folder a trapper, because it traps papers. And the guy's like, well, what do we call the thing that holds the folders? And he says, well, trapper keeper. Ding. Perfect. <laughs> let's do it. Over some martinis. That's a drunken name if I've ever heard <laughs> right? one. Right, but it make, kind of makes sense. It totally makes sense. So I was kind of hoping like his boss's name was like Johnny Keeper or something. Or, yeah, I don't John know. Trapper from yeah. like Mash. <laughs> um, so they're like, okay, great. We got the name. We have the product design. We have the idea. We need to test the market to see if this is even something people are interested or will buy. Right. So somehow they choose Wichita, Kansas. They shoot a commercial wow. of five thousand dollars, and basically it's this kid like a kind of a nerdy kid standing in front of his locker and this hot girl walks by and he's like oh and he drops his books and his papers go all over sure and they're like uh if you would have had the trapper keeper that wouldn't have happened nerd. <laughs> so that's the commercial so they show the commercial only in wichita like uh during i think it was at nighttime okay and then they the next weekend they put it out for sale and they sold out every single trapper keeper in in wichita like you couldn't get it people were fighting kids were fighting in the store to get wow. them and they were like, at Mead, they were like, okay, yeah, this is a hit. It's gonna we're going to do this. Yep. So then the original ones that were released, there were six. There was a red bl- one, a blue one, and a green one. Okay. And then they had three that had stock images. There was a picture of some dudes playing soccer 
There was one with a dog and a cat, and there was one of like the Oregon coastline. <laughs> what? And that was it. That was your designs. Yeah. And they they sold all out of everything. I wonder right. how they came up with those three. Right. Like dog and cat makes sense, but does it though? Soccer in Oregon don't, coastline. Yeah, I don't know. It was just stock pictures that they could buy cheap. Oh, okay. Oh. So we, <laughs> I don't know why I was thinking this, but when you said Oregon coastline, uh-huh. I'm thinking like. Like just a map of Oregon. <laughs> oh no, it was just like a picture of it was the a picture water. Of it. Wait, that makes more sense. Okay. So, um, yeah, they do that. That's the first ones you can pick from. And then let's see what year. Oh, at that time when they released them, the folders cost twenty nine cents. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the keeper itself was four ninety five. So you're talking probably yeah. seven to ten dollars to get a bunch of folders in the trapper keeper. Right. Right. And but that had something to do with the social status thing, though. Like yeah. it, with your with your popularity, I'm like, sure. You know, I didn't have one at first. It was just how it was. I never had one. I had a knockoff one, and that's maybe what you're talking about with the, because they never had like a zipper. They never had the zipper or, no. or the. Mm-hmm. So when they first made them, they had a snap, a button snap. Yep. Mm. And three years later, they swapped that out for Velcro. Velcro. I because they were that. like, people were having a hard time getting the button to snap, mm-hmm. and they're like, okay, and it made a sound, and they didn't like that. Well, then they started showing up on this, like, do not buy list. Like, teachers would send it home. Like, okay, here's things you can have for a classroom. Right. And here's stuff you can't. And they put it on the do not buy list because the teachers were annoyed by the Velcro sound. The rip. Yeah. Or they said they were too big. And then they were like, well, these aren't, that's the knockoff one. This is what we have. Right. They show it to them. And then the teachers would be like, oh, okay, yeah, that's, yeah, that's fine. fine. So it was like a thing for a while. They were almost banned. Hmm. Um. Which, you, which would increase their popularity even more. Yes. 1988. This is when we really get talking popularity. I was a freshman in high school. Okay. The designer series comes out. Mm. And they started making all sorts of different tie-ins. Oh, and they had yes. licensing with a bunch of them. So here's the most popular ones. Garfield. Mm-hmm. Lisa Frank. Oh, Lisa Frank. Yeah. Sonic the Hedgehog. And Lamborghini, even. Le- I remember the Lamborghini one. Yeah, license their images yes. to get on Trapper Keepers. So if if anyone out there who's listening to this, which maybe be two people that know me, mm-hmm. um, I have been using the Lisa Frank Trapper Keeper joke <laughs> for ten years at least. That's something I've always wanted for Christmas. That's something I want. I never got it. I want it for Christmas. I've used it forever, and yeah. then I there it is. There it was is. one of the most popular ones. Yeah, I had a unicorn. I remember. I, it makes it's it's so funny that they used Wichita as the first. Yeah, I like, don't know why. Okay, what's the shittiest market in the yeah. United States? Because if we can sell it here, <laughs> and I can say this because no offense, Wichita, I'm from Kansas. I can yeah. say this. Oh yeah, they right? know exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not great. If it sells here, good lord, it'll it's sell everywhere sell anywhere. <laughs> yeah, they've done a bunch of different like remakes to them, and they've changed some things. You could. Um, one of the things about the folders, if you remember this, it had like times tables on them yes. and it had like, uh, capital cities and just different facts and stuff. And teachers were trying to ban those cause they're like, Oh, kids are cheating. Oh, cheating. Cause yeah. you got the answers right on the folder. And that was, a, everybody a, loved a that. Ruler. I had, uh-huh. like a ruler. Yeah, had a ruler, all sorts yeah. of stuff. Uh, 2014, they relaunched and their two big ones were Hello Kitty and Star Wars. Oh. So good license. You could probably have. find a Star yeah. Wars Trapper Keeper if you wanted to. Still made by Mead. Still. Still, yeah. I think Mead is another company now, but they're mm-hmm. still owned by the same people. Um, they these things have been featured in Napoleon Dynamite. Do you remember that? Oh, heck yeah. Uh, South Park, Full House, and most recently Stranger Things. I almost it almost sounded like Napoleon when I said that. Yeah. Yeah. Do what I want, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Mead. I'm actually looking this up. Mead. Uh, Mead Company. What? Mead Trapper Keeper. Let's look that yep. up. Trapper. Trapper Keeper. Trapper Keeper. Does Mead even still exist? Good Lord. They so st- I, yep. yeah, I they know do. the company name because I know that they always have that little tag on, on mm-hmm. their stuff and it just says mm-hmm. Mead. Yep. Uh, they make pencils too. Yep. They make all sorts of office supplies. And yeah. then in the article I was reading, like this guy was like, this was the greatest thing in office and school supplies and it just, tr- just crushed the market. And I thought, whoever would, as a kid, be like, you know what I want to do someday? Crush the school supply market. Yeah. <laughs> but apparently there's some people out there that do. And that was the first, so that was not the first thing I thought of when I thought of mead, but I was like, oh, the mead trapper keeper. Are we going to do a mead again? I don't know. I better throw this information out there because I know that Rich would remember. Here, here's the thing. Like, if you are out to to crush a market, uh-huh. right, no one gives two shits about 
the the school like like you know that's that sort of stuff yeah it, that's it like you would own you would own it like you could tell people like i'm going to dominate the school supply market right like i don't give a damn yeah who cares i mean what, it, it what is it in uh trains planes and automobiles he he sells the shower ring the curtain sh- or yes whatever. yes the ring the plastic rings yep for shower curtains or uh, tommy boy with the brake pads mm-hmm. i mean that's the things you just don't think about get a good look at a there's a, there's a ton of things like that especially in toys like what was a jelly thing with all the little floaty you know what i'm talking about it's a tube and it's got all the little floaty um like stars and stuff oh, like and that you squeeze them and or you something. squeeze yeah. it yeah like I know what you're talking about. That guy yeah. made it's almost like a snake. Kinda. So much money. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of money out there. Yeah. Well, uh Dolan and I went for a second pour on this one before we get into this one. I'm gonna like I'm gonna applaud you when you finish that. Yeah. yeah. It, was a, it was a big pour. It was. <laughs> you went strong. <laughs> Let's be honest. I'm you can handle. I'm it. I'm one meeting away from being an alcoholic, so <laughs> this is okay to me. I'm totally fine with this. Yeah. So, so what do you think after after you've had a few drinks of it? I now? absolutely love it. I wish we had done it sooner. Mm. Holy smokes! I love you it. You went from it burns my nose to I love it. I was super scared just smelling it, but then once you get into it, if you like, like again, if you like wine, uh-huh. or if you like if you like a heavy pour with a cocktail mm-hmm. right i like it when yeah. i like some vodka burn it's uh-huh. just that's okay yeah if you like that this is a hundred percent for you this is an uh, a, a mead buzz is an amazing buzz it's, <laughs> it's almost it's very similar to wine though you don't want to go too far that's true so what's it called again big i'm looking it up on the untapped here big lost big uh lost. wild man wild man <laughs> yeah, i think we just gotta look up wild man because i don't see anything big lost here so. uh you know I think I already tried searching this before, and it was really hard to find. Hmm. Oh no, that was the um, the brown ale that I brought back yeah. from. I don't know. We might. Gillette Brewing Company. I mean, I know that there there are meads on here, but I don't know if this one will be. It. You know what? I, it's not. It. I don't see. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, I think I found it. Here it is. Here it is. You're saying yeah, eighteen percent ABV, no IBUs. Yep. One check in. Uh oh, who's this? Dolan. One. Dolan checked in. Was it me? It uh, was. It, it was, was me. What did I? What did I rate it? I, he was blacked out at the time, so I'm not oh, gonna remind him. Uh, yeah, I did. Okay, so <laughs> in the beginning <laughs> you of did the no, I, no, 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 no. In the beginning of the episode, I said I had a flight, and that did me. Well, I've yeah. I, as we were talking, I remembered that I had a flight of all their beers, and then a flight of all their meads. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Good and for then you. Sam had to carry him back home, and yeah. she drove home. Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Only yeah, sure. 171 check-ins. Yeah. Uh, our friend Dolan, in, in his drunken state, uh-huh. rated this a 4.25. Oh. Hmm. Which uh. is, I can tell you is high for its actual rating. Yeah. I'm going to guess it's the actual rating is probably 3.44. Mm. You want to come down off the 4.25 a little bit? See, or? if I were to re-rate it, I'd re-rate it a 4.5. But oh boy. like I said, I well, think you it, can tastes, re-rate it. Yeah. it tastes better than what it was before. So... Mm-hmm. If I'm going to go off of what other people think, I think this is weird. This is different. This is not something mm-hmm. that's going yeah. to be used to or that somebody's going to be used to on yeah. the palette wise. Um, so I think it's like a 3.5, 2. 3.8. Oh, that's pretty good. Yep. The other thing about Gillette, how is that one of the top three cities in Wyoming? Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's the top three cities. Uh, there's there was a lot of um, coal mines in the area, yeah. so there was a lot of people. But if you're talking top cities, I'd say yeah. like Cheyenne, Cheyenne Laramie, Laramie uh, Casper. So that's what I'm thinking. So like, it's weird that this is even there in yeah. the state, let alone, yeah. but then it's like in the fourth or fifth biggest city. Right. It's just crazy that it's still around. You know what I mean? Like we couldn't supp- we couldn't keep one al- alive, alive or around here in Omaha. I think Gillette is one of those things, setting the coal mining aside, is like just people who grew up in Rapid City that is tired of Rapid City. So they <laughs> just screw this. We're go out. two yeah. hours west and yeah. Mm-hmm. There's an interesting breakdown. I normally don't do this, but I went and looked just because of Dolan's experience coming off the tap versus the bottle. Uh-huh. Um, off the tap, so a draft version of this, only 12 ratings at 4.21, hmm. which is about spot on where he was at. Exactly. So there must be something to that alcohol burn the, mm-hmm. the kind of people like. Right. Oh, it definitely was because um, I had talked to when we had, we did research going up there because I knew that I was going to bring like beers back for this and I was going to bring other things back. And uh, Sam, my wife, was like, you know, there's there's a meadery there. We should you should try that. Have you ever had mead on the episode? And I was like, no. 
And so we started researching it up on the way. So I was expecting more of a beer flavor. I was I was even going as far as like maybe it's like a honey stout, mm-hmm. but um, but it, it was way more liquor off the tap than okay. I was expecting. So I think that's why. It's uh, yeah. I, I think that and that might have something to do with it. So people that would seek out the meadery would want that. Yeah. And so they would naturally generate it higher. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where somebody was just like us given the bottle. Yeah. I think this is I mean it's it's right in the middle for me. I think it's a four. That there's nothing wrong with mm, that. And yeah, that's good. Seeing as how I've never had one before, you know. Yeah, I'm I'm kinda surprised that you like it, but not totally, I guess. I Yeah. I mean you don't usually tend to like sweet stouts or things like that. That's true. That's true. You, but you if, know what? If Over, it was more sour, I would be like, Oh yeah, you'd you'd love <laughs> totally it. love this. Over the Christmas break, uh I, I I, I took my own advice, right? Uh-huh. And I branched out a little bit. Oh, okay. And I tried some different styles. I, I tried some stouts. How's that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Instead of just like, okay, what IPA do you have on, you know, uh-huh. whatever, give me, what's your best stout? What's your best yeah. porter or whatever? I wasn't disappointed with my choices. There you go. Well, look, I wasn't. Yeah, mm-hmm. somebody else helped you too, which is good. I'm not quite to your status, right? How You're, you're self-proclaimed. Stout. I love stout. Stout, yeah. if I may, mm-hmm. stout slut status. Ah, yes. <laughs> yes. You called yourself that. I'm on getting Facebook, that tramp stamp right? tattoo. I'm, like, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I am not quite to that. But uh, one of these days, we will do uh, a Yeti from Great Divide oh, right in Colorado. Mm, yeah. I had the S'mores Yeti. Ooh, I've never had that. Oh, my goodness. That sounds good. It was everything you would expect it to be and more. So. Here's the first topic of that I actually planned on when I knew we were going to do mead. Okay. And it's not totally related, but kind of is. And it's just, that's how my brain works. So mm-hmm. I'm thinking, uh, lately I've been working a lot. We're busy, which yes. is good, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. It pays for the mead. Yep. Um, but also, it like, doesn't leave me a lot of time except to be at work, go home, maybe eat dinner, read some books to my kid and go to sleep and do it all over again. Sure. Uh, so one of the uh, book series that he's really into is the Berenstein Bears. Oh, yeah. And here's our tie-in. Honey. Mm. There's a character in the Berenstein Bears named Honey. Bears eat honey. And bears love honey. Mm-hmm. And the first Berenstein Bears book was called The Big Honey Hunt. Oh. So we're going to talk about Berenstein Bears today, okay. a little history of that. I so this it. is something even Dolan wouldn't know about, I would think. And I learned a lot of stuff along the way, which is kind of fun. So the authors and illustrators of these books uh, were Stanley and Janice Berenstein, right? They met in 1941 in art school in Philadelphia. They weren't brother and sister? No. Oh. They got married. I never knew. Um, 1941, what's that? That's the start of the World War II. World War II. So yeah. he is end up going into the army. Okay. And he becomes a medical illustrator. So like for the doctors, he would draw like pictures of uh, like maybe the inside of a intestine or like oh. what the in, like he was an illustrator for like mm-hmm. their medical stuff. Oh yeah. Okay. Because he was a, a good drawer. So they know what they're getting into before they right. get into it. Okay. Because they sense. don't have what we have now. Photographs and stuff. And she became a riveter, like Rosie. Like the riveter. Rosie. Yeah. Like that. Oh. And then after the war, they get back together and they get married and they move out to a uh, small town outside of uh, Philadelphia and they start doing cartoons um, like in for the Saturday Evening Post and mm-hmm. Collier's and all those, the big magazines of the day. Sure. And they were kind of adult, not, you know, like adult with quotes, but just things for magazines. Right. So in the late 50s, like 57, they decide, you know what, we want to get into this new market that's called children's books. We have an idea. We got an idea for a mom and a dad and a bear and with a baby. What year is this again? 1957. Wow, okay. So they work on this, and they get it done. They have um, a deal in place with Random House Books, mm-hmm. and they turn in the manuscript, and their editor happens to be a guy named Dr. Seuss. No way. He's the editor. No and way. And he says... What is this? This isn't this isn't fleshed out. There's no information. This isn't good enough. He said, "What kind of pipe uh, tobacco does Papa Bear smoke? What uh, what does Mom like to do in the afternoon?" He's like, "You need to know the characters better before you release this book." And they're like, "What?" 
you you write like one sentence books. Right. What are you talking about? And you, you just make shit up if you yeah. like the who's and fluffers are the right. Sm- so he's so they hunters. were like what? But they kept working on it. And it took them five years before the book was finally published, and that was the big honey hunt, nineteen sixty two. Hmm. So then the next thing he says is okay. There's a ton of bears out there, especially in kids' books. You got Goldilocks. You got you know this one. There's a bunch of other things that he was naming. Mm-hmm. Stay away from bears. If you're going to do another kids' book, do a different animal, right? And they're like, okay. So they start working on this book with a penguin. Well, six months later, they're almost getting close to being done with it. And he's like, uh, we sold out of the book. It's amazing. <laughs> it's like the hottest thing out there. <laughs> we need more of these, please. And they're yeah. like, cool. So they make another one, which is called The Bike Lesson. I have both of those books, Mm. and I read those to my son. Those are some of the first books that we bought, Mm -hmm. and he got one of them, I think, for the baby shower. We got one of those books. Yep. So those are the two we have uh, that we started with, with the collection. Okay. And I've read those many, many times. So that's where I was like, aha, honey, the big honey hunt. Mm -hmm. So those are 50, 60 years old now, almost 70 years old. When you get to the, you know, the final, like when they first started it to where it is now, um, there's 300 total books in the series, which is ridiculous. 300. 300. Wow. Um, they, I guess between the first book and the second book, Mm -hmm. Dr. Seuss, uh, took some liberties and he said, you know what? Stanley and Janice, those are, yeah, those are kind of all right names. Let's go with Stan and Jan. Let's just go with Stan and Jan. Right. And let's put the Berenstein Bears right on the top of the book so everybody knows what this is. Oh. We're going to brand it. And those were his ideas. And he didn't run them past the authors. He was just like, we're doing this. Yeah, he's the editor. He can do that. And it worked out pretty good. Pretty right? good, yes. So in the, let's see, they did those books. They did them like a bunch every year um, from the 60s all the way up into still currently, they're still making these books. How old are they? Well, they're not around anymore. Oh. So. That's too bad. Stan died in, I think it was 95, and Jan passed away 2012. And they had two sons. One was named Leo, and one was named as Mike. Okay. And they took over the family business. Leo does the business part, so he's okay. like the work out the, the deals and the money and that sort of stuff. Yep. And Mike is the one that comes up with the stories and the illustrations. Hmm. So he has kept going up um, in, I think there's some, let's see what year did I write it down? It's very similar to like you and Steve, Steve and Rich. That's true. <laughs> there you go. Steve deals with the numbers. And, I and you got the artistic the, stuff. Yeah, Rich, that's, that's, yeah. A, that's absolutely true. Uh, Sister Bear was added in 74. Because they were getting a lot of letters from girls saying, how come there's no girl in these stories? There's been 10 years of these books and there's no girl. So they added her. And then in 2000, Honey Bear was introduced. And they did like a writing campaign. So she was the youngest sister. Yep. And they said, okay, who did the contest? You can name this bear. Write us a letter and tell us what the name should be and why. Mm -hmm. And Honey Bear won. So there's another honey tie-in. Were they born or do they just show up? Like, Yeah, they were. I think they were born. They did a book like... That one was called Birds and the Bees oh. and Bears or something like that. And that sure. was in 2000. And it was like um, to talk about what happens when you're having a baby or whatever. Hmm, okay. So basically the storylines of these books are very similar. And that's one of the criticisms of them is that basically the kids have a problem. Or they run into something that they don't know about. Yep. And they go to dad and dad messes it up. No, right? He that, tells them, and then it makes it actually makes it worse. This is real life. And then the mom series. comes in and sets it straight. Again, real life. Right. Yeah. yeah. So but that's... You could say the same thing about any, like, children's TV episodes. I mean... Sure. Basically. Yeah. And they said... Yeah. Uh, they asked him, how come you guys picked the bear, right? And they said, well, uh, contrary to popular opinion and belief, it doesn't have anything to do with our names. It's more because uh, mother bears are fierce and protective and, like, good mothers... And the dads are like aloof and not really around. And they're like, we can take that those characteristics, and that's basically the Simpsons. Yeah, goofy dad. I mean, it's the most every cartoon. Do- sure. Goofy dad, straight mom. Yep, solves the problems, and that's how it works. Mm-hmm. So after the Mike guy takes over the son, he kind of um, keeps it going, but he also like branches out and he does real religious ones now. So they have like Berenstein Bears Bible, like for kids, and they mm-hmm. have like. The story of Easter. I know my kid has that one. My mom got him. Hmm. And they have like religious versions also, but then they have the ones that you probably remember or reading or I had as a kid, like 
stranger danger and like yes. too much candy and all that sort of mm-hmm. stuff. Um, in the eighties, there was two years where they did a cartoon on Saturday mornings. And then in 2003, yeah. they made another one. It was on PBS. There was like 50 episodes of that. Hmm. Uh, they made it in Canada and they showed it on PBS. So like another generation of kids knows about Berenstein bears hmm. and, uh, yeah, they still make them today and they're still pretty popular. There's like, I think they started licensing it in 83 and by 85, they had 150 different things with the Berenstein bears on it and uh, made them $50 million, which is a lot in the eighties. I would yeah, think. Yeah. Um, for, you know, something that they just did as doodles. Good work. So, yeah, that's what I got on the Berenstein Bears, I think. Let me double check my notes. Oh, here's some more good stuff. Video games. They had Berenstein Bears video games. I recall. Really? Yeah. They had one. The first one came out on Atari in 1983. Mm-hmm. And then the last one they made was in 2006, which played for Windows, like a desktop oh, computer game or whatever. Um, but, yeah, that's what I know about that. I'm trying really hard to warm it up. Because oh. I noticed as I got to the bottom of my very generous pour mm-hmm. that it was a little warmer and there was way more honey forward. Oh, yeah. More so than the cold one. So I'm, I've, That might be why they offered it that way at the maybe. meadery. Hmm, maybe. So I've been, I've been doing my best to warm it up here. Well, you got a bottle opener because we're going to need it. I just spilled it all over my face. We're going to meet it. <laughs> we're going to meet it. Hey. <laughs> all right. So um, I have one more thing. To talk about. Okay. And we're also going to talk about this mead here. Okay. This bonus mead. This is a bonus mead, and this is a session mead. It's 8%. <laughs> oh. Which you said this yesterday, and I had session to laugh. Mead. Like, yeah. Session mead. That's not what generally session means, but okay. But in this world, it does. In so this world, it does, yeah. This is one that my brother-in-law made, and he has made, I think, was it last year maybe, or two years, he would tell me, um, he entered a mead in the homebrew competition and he won the whole competition with his mead. Mm. So he knows how to make meads. Um, there's a guy that we have met that's been here, Nate Wheat. Yes. He makes amazing meads. He makes them with boiler. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a couple friends in Lincoln that are also in the beer club, Nathan and Emily. They make good meads. Mm-hmm. They also make this thing that I've never had before. They're the only people who have ever made it. It's basically mead, but that's made with maple syrup. Whoa. So instead of honey, they use maple syrup. Weird. And it tastes like maple syrup wine. Yum. It is amazing. Oh, Peter my God. Peter Summers, recruiter, mm-hmm. where are you at? Let's Bring it. some of that. Right. Bring it. I bet you he could do it because he already makes beer and he makes honey. Right. Or yeah. he makes syrup. He makes syrup, beer, yeah. and yeah. And he also, you know, has the barrels. Right. Mm-hmm. So he's a barrel age at. Oh, boy. So that's what we got. But this one uh, is called a pancake mead. It has aronia berries. Uh, I guarantee you those are from his sister's farm in Iowa, and then there's blueberry, and there's maple and vanilla. So we're getting all those flavors. Yum. What'd you think about it warmed up? I can tell you, it warmed up. Um, it, tastes, it tastes more burning. <laughs> 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 so that was a thing. That was, uh, that was actually one of the things when I was there, and I got the blueberry, the seasonal. Yeah. Um, the person working the counter that night, she said, uh, warm this up. Yeah. And I was like, what? And she's like, yeah, I'll pop it in the microwave for you if you're like 20 seconds. Like, I will warm this up for you. It's amazing. And I didn't necessarily agree, but I could see why somebody would like it. Huh. Yeah. I think I liked it warmer better. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost probably like a, uh, like a mold wine at that point. Mm. You ever had that, you know? Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Um, one of the other things I didn't say earlier when we were talking about mead, and I, I did mention still mm-hmm. versus carbonated. So... Carbonated, um, there was a little bit of pss when I opened this. Mm-hmm. There wasn't anything with that one. No. Um, but it, just imagine it with bubbles. Okay. Because that's at the meadery in Bellevue mm. when it was there. Like that yeah. was actually more popular version because it's more relatable to what people drink. You know what I mean? It's like some sure. like drinks, like cocktails or whatever, usually like a soda or something. It's got some bubbles. So. Yep. Um, hand me your glass or Dolan and I'll get you going with this one. So this one should be a lot different color. Bonus mead looks, oh my, it looks like wine almost. I mean, that's what it is, honey wine. Yeah, it's honey wine. It's like a purple-ish pale, like a plum color. Most of that color is going to come from the aronia berries Hmm. and the blueberry puree, I'm guessing. Interesting. Yeah, it's a very plum color-ish looking. I have not tried this. I haven't had it. Hmm. So he brought a bottle last time he was over and... I saved it for this. Brother-in-law. Is this your sister's? Mm-hmm. Your sister's yep, husband? He's is my that, okay. brew-in-law. They're not married, but they, they'll they never get married. So oh, okay. after like 15 years, he's he's in the fam. So Brew-in-law. That's I'm what like I call that. him because he's my homebrew guy. That's fantastic. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> Smells amazing. I'm going to guess it will be good. Mm. 
because he doesn't he doesn't let anything go out that's not good. It it smells like blueberry pancakes. Well, it really does. That's the goal. Weird. <sighs> yeah, it does. Get yeah. that vanilla. Whoa. Yeah. You know the just try it and I'm going to describe it to you. You know the uh blueberry syrup from IHOP? Dude. Spot on. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> are you kidding with this that is amazing so that's mead that's how you can do it yum so you notice the difference between what dolan brought just because mm-hmm. it's straight and not fruit added and this one has four additives to it right yeah so you can do anything with which is one of the fun things with mead uh, and that's why a lot of home brewers mess with it and tinker it takes a long time but like you said if you make it wrong it's expensive to it's expensive, dump expensive yeah my friend john who i was talking about earlier i remember the first time he made mead uh, it was not great, and mm. we we both knew it, but we both drank it anyway. And we we're like, we, uh, <laughs> well, it's a year's worth of work. <laughs> we got drunk, you know. That was the end result. What do you think of this one? Oh, I'm You're right. You. It's it's like IHOP blueberry syrup. pancakes. Yeah, IHOP blueberry. The blueberry syrup and IHOP for your pancakes is exactly what I taste. It's one of those things like when you eat something that has like levels of flavor. Mm -hmm. Like first you taste this, then you taste this, and Mm -hmm. then after, and you breathe out, and then you taste this. Well, that's what you're supposed to get. I mean, that's what beer should do. And and mead in this case, um, this is the most complex flavored mead that he's made that I know Mm. about. He used to make a really amazing apricot one that was real good in the summertime. D- does he... I could eat plain pancakes with this and then just wash it down. <laughs> you could. You could <laughs> make like in the syrup. syrup yeah. Like that? Holy cow. <laughs> Why is he not producing this? Because Cause it's his hobby. I, oh, my goodness. If he did it for money, then it would be a job and it wouldn't be fun anymore. That's what he's told mm. me. False. A lot of people have been inquiring about him. You know, there's a lot of opportunities yeah. in Nebraska for brewers, you know? That's ludicrous. Well, yeah. Brew brother, yeah, I'll Brew pay. I'll pay you for a bottle. <laughs> I, I don't know how much he made of this. I'll, I'll have to find out. But this is his, one of his most recent ones. He's made some that were seventeen percent, like kind of what we were drinking earlier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this one he cut down, and it's only eight, so more approachable for people that aren't used to that big boozy bomb. That's. Cool. I'm gonna. I'm not taking any more of this just so we can pass it out on the floor, maybe a little bit out there when we're done. There are enough people out there that like that enjoy sours mm-hmm. and, and others that, mm. that would... I mean, I might splash a little more in my glass. I don't want to, you know, give them too much. Wow. So I have one more I'm piece of... I'm going to let other people enjoy it. No, he's going to have more. There's one more piece <laughs> of uh, information I have. Okay. And I tricked you guys. Sweet. On purpose. I said the name Berenstein wrong on purpose. Okay. Because of the Mandela effect. Have you heard of the Mandela effect? Yes. Yes. Dolan, do you know about the Mandela effect? Yeah. It's where you think something happened, but it didn't happen. Yeah. It's a Mm -hmm. false memory basically when it comes down to it. Mm. And the Berenstein bears are one of the main examples of this. Okay. Because it's actually the Berenstain S T A I N. Okay. I wondered about that because I was Googling it on my phone Mm -hmm. and it came up Berenstain. Yes, but and I was saying Steen because in my mind as a kid, that's what my mom called it. That's what it looked like to me. Yeah. That's how I thought it was pronounced, but it's Stain. The person reading me these books at the uh-huh. library? Yeah. Mm. They were all wrong. It's no. Baron Stain, S-T-A-I-N. That's how you spell their name. Bar- Baron Stain. Baron Instead Stain. of Baron Steen, I S-T-I-N. And the thing about it is at first I was like, I know these bears. I know these bears. And uh-huh. I wasn't 100% sure. Sure enough, I, I pulled up the... The Google search, uh-huh. and and first I found out, like, oh man, I had like a lot of these books growing oh, yeah. up, a yeah. lot of them. We have probably forty of them now, and I know I have more of those as a kid that my mom still has, but we've purchased a whole bunch and hmm. that sort of stuff. But so I tricked you into saying that wrong on purpose, so, so I could talk about the Mandela effect. Okay. And basically, what I did as we finished this mead, the bonus mead, um, I have some of the most famous examples of this as far as. Um, advertising and pop culture stuff goes. Mm-hmm. So we already hit the Berenstein one. Febreze. <laughs> yes, I know about this two one. Two E's versus one E. What is it? I one have, E or two? I don't know. It's, it's one. It's, it's one it's E. one, yeah. But people think it's two. How hmm. about uh, Sex at the City? Huh? Say again? Sex and the City. Sex and the City? On HBO. It's Sex and the City. Sex in the City. Yeah. But, but a lot of people think it's Sex and the City. Oh. Oh. I thought you were going to tell me different. I'm like, no, I've yeah. always known it as Sex in the City. Right. <laughs> no, good for you. 
Um, bologna, your favorite kind? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oscar Mayer? No, no, no. Meyer. No. It's Oscar Meyer. Meyer. It's Mayer. M-A-Y-E-R. It's Oscar Mayer. No, it's not. What? It's pronounced Meyer, but it's spelled at M-A-Y-E-R. Just think the song. That's ridiculous. M-A-Y-E-R, like John Mayer. Okay. Skechers. Mm-hmm. Shoes. There's no T in Skechers. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, whoa, <laughs> what? No T in Skechers, y'all. No T. Ske- so Skecher. Yeah. Sketch. I never thought about it that hard. It's no T. How, how would you pronounce it then? Skechers. That's how you pronounce it. There's no T. Okay. Right. Uh, Fruit Loops. Oh, boy. F R O O T. Yeah. Fruit, Fruit Loops. Right. Uh, the Monopoly Man. Uh, Money Bags. What's his name? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, Does he yeah. have a monocle? Yes. Mm, he does? Yes. No, he does not. What? He does not he have a monocle. He definitely has a monocle. No, he doesn't. Well, rich, smart, old dudes have monocles. What? Some people think it's because you're thinking of Mr. Peanut, who does have one. Oh. But the Monopoly Man does not have a monocle. Okay. Pikachu. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. What color is right. his tail? His tail is brown. Yellow. It's all yellow. Yeah. Some people think it's yellow with a black tip. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Nope. All yellow. Why is that? Pichu? Because Pichu has a black tip? No idea. See, now he's getting too deep into I'm Pokemon. Too, I'm too old for that. Oh, okay. I, I just threw all that right. one in there for you. We could talk about this all day. I think it's Raichu has a black tip. Maybe Raichu. He evolves. All I know is... Uh, no, I don't know anything else. <laughs> How about Cheez-Its? Is it Cheez-Its or Cheez-It? It's Cheez-It. I would say it's Cheez-Its. Dolan's right. It's Cheez It. No. Yeah. The only reason I know this is because I hate Cheez Its. Oh my god. That's Have you tried the extra toasty? Okay. The Parmesan? Here here's what I do like. The white cheddar. Yeah, those mm. are good. Everything else is nasty. I like the hot, the spicy ones. I've never Try had them. Try the extra toasty. Hmm. It's like okay. ones that they burned and they're like, <laughs> like what do we do with these? Oh, I put them in a box. It's like the mystery flavor dum dums. It's it. All that is is when they have to change flavors oh, in the factory. Tell me about it. <laughs> so it's it's like part of one flavor and then the next, and then when it starts coming out the regular flavor, then they then they make yeah, that. Yeah, well, it's so grape now. Okay, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's we'll smart though. They don't waste anything. How about uh, this one? You should know. Okay. Double stuff Oreo. Yeah. One F or two? One. Double stuff. It's one, isn't it? It is one. Yeah. yeah. It's one. Yeah. Look, I know my Oreos. I figured you'd know that one. How about Fruit of the Loom? Fruit of, fruit of the Loom. Fruit of Corna, the Cornucopia or no, behind the fruit? Cornucopia. Yes. I would say yes. No, no cornucopia. What? Never. What? Not once has there been a cornucopia behind the fruit of the loom. But, but like, oh, I guess... I'd have to look it up. Mm. I did. You don't have to. <laughs> I'd almost argue that, but okay. Uh, Flintstones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One T or two T's? One. Flint. Well, two if you count the one in stones. Stones. Yeah, I would say <laughs> yes. one, one. It's two. F-L-I-N-T-T-S-T-O-N. F-L-I-N-T-S-T-O-N, yes. Okay. Flint stones. Oh, I see. Flint stones versus flint uh, stones. Oh. Right. It's flint because flint is, you know, flint, like you make like a fire, fire stone. Yes. Right. Old style. Yep. So okay. two T's and flint stones. Yep. Um, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Forrest Gump. Yes. Forrest Gump. Guess yeah. what the actual quote was? What? Life was like a box of chocolates. Are you serious? Yeah, that's, what, that's was, what Forrest said. Yeah, life was like a box of chocolates. Mom always said, "Life was like a box of chocolates." Pow! No way. Mm. How about this? I'm actually gonna look this. No, one that's up. that's for real. Um, uh, Snow White. Okay. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Uh huh. Uh huh. That's not what she says. It's mm, uh, false. That's you're uh, you're nope. making this up. No. Nope. Magic mirror on the wall. Yeah. Oh, who's that's the fairest right. of them Magic all. mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? I've I've seen that one before. I've read that or read about it. And then there's two I say for you specifically. Once you're done with your okay. research, you're right. It's yeah. <laughs> it's, so, that's there's right. two Star Wars ones. Oh sweet. Okay, here we go. One of them. Yep. Is that C3PO is all gold? It's false. You're right. He was what? Not. Yeah, he was not. He had there was some silver. He had some yeah, silver. Silver leg. Mm-hmm. That's he true. had one silver leg. Yes, he did. Yep. 
and in <laughs> and that his was, left leg. Yeah, and, and there was a throwback to when he had the red arm in Force mm-hmm. Awakens. It was kind of a throwback to that. The silver. Did leg. they ever make him all gold in anything? Like any of the animation? Oh, oh yeah, like the droids cartoon. He yeah, was yeah, all yeah. gold. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what I would rem- I would remember him from any of the cartoons. Mm-hmm. I never watched anything but the cartoons. Oh, yep, that's wrong. Right. And the last one is a quote from Star Wars. Oh boy, here we go. I know this is this is Darth Vader. I'm your father. Yeah, Luke, yes, I am no, your father. And that's not that is not the case. No. He's good. He's good right. on the Star Wars. What's the real quote? The quote, the real quote is like Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father and Luke says, "I, I know the truth. I, I I you killed him." And he said, "No, I am your father." Yeah, but everybody thinks it's Luke. I am your father. Right. No. He told me enough. He told so, me you okay. killed him. And he says, "No." I am, I your, am father. your father, not right. Luke. I am your father. Right, right. Which is awesome if you go back and read. Like nobody had that in their script except for David Prowse, or except for um, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, David Prowse, who was in the Darth, Darth Vader Darth costume, Vader, yeah, who's actually speaking mm-hmm. the lines and that and, they redubbed or whatever, exactly. Yeah. And he took it to Lucas, and he was like, uh, uh, "What is this right?" He's <laughs> like, "Yep," and he's like, "Yep." You just need to say it because and. Mark Hamill didn't even know. And so that's wow. like an authentic hmm. reaction. Oh, that's cool. They go into that scene and Lucas is like, okay, something's going to happen here and I need an authentic reaction to this. And so that's exactly what happened there. That's cool that he thought about it and planned that so far ahead. You yep. know what I mean? Yeah. Hmm. So out of all the Mandela effects that you just listed, I'm uh-huh. surprised you didn't bring up the... Um, uh, wasn't there... Didn't somebody think that somebody died but never actually died well there's there's a bunch of those but Jim one of Morrison, them ambrose beers no, no, uh, no. one of them is actually nelson mandela which is where it comes from which is where it comes from people okay. thought he died in prison right mm-hmm. but he didn't no. he got out and he lived for uh, about 10 years afterwards yeah uh, another one people thought died that didn't uh was neil armstrong okay so they remember him dying um another one that they said was billy graham you remember him, the televangelist? Superstar Billy Graham? Uh, no, not the wrestler. Not the wrestler. No. So he was this televangelist, and he is related. I don't remember who's related to, but um, he was on TV a lot, and he just died last, uh, 2018, but people remember him dying like years and years ago. Mm. And then uh, Patrick Swayze, surprisingly, was <laughs> really? one. Yeah. It's really? They're like, oh, we, th- we thought he recovered from that cancer. No, he mm. didn't. I, seen, I saw the pictures. Wow. Ah. So that's what, that's what the Mandela effect is, and it's been like kind of studied recently and um what was there there was a couple other ones i didn't write down curious george the monkey yeah he does yep. not have a tail but people think he does um you just changed my life kit kat has a hyphen in it i kit knew that kat, i knew yes. that yeah mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i eat too many of those i know that <laughs> i think i think those are all the ones i can think off the top of my head but it's kind of a cool thing hmm, it is because that berenstein bear one really stuck in my craw when i heard that a couple years ago and i was like what no way i have to check <laughs> and it was real berenstein bears berenstein bears yep hmm. so there we go tied to honey not really <sighs> but it was the mandela effect berenstein bears tied to honey because mm-hmm. bears eat honey they you have think- a kid named honey we're drinking mead that's where we're at. There you, you go. You, you'd think that we would cover more honey and honey bees in this episode, but if you want that, there's a previous episode, um, the honey You're on uh, it. beer true. that we drank. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, that I, I believe Heather Kylan, one Texas. of our recruiters, brought us. Yeah, we did the killer bees on that. So one, yeah, yes. yeah, check out that one if you want to mm-hmm. know more about beers and stuff. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, me yeah, beer and beer hives. Yeah, this that's why I went kind of a different way with this one, just because yeah. I knew we'd already touched sure. on that, and I just I don't know. There's something about Things that I take for granted as part of my childhood, mm-hmm. or just even even now, mm-hmm. things like I would like to know, like, oh, where did that come from, or what what is actually about that, and so that's what we did today. Hey, and that ties in with honey in a way. Things you take right. for granted, and yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. that's true. Here's here's what I take for granted that that everything always tastes the same, right? Ever wherever you go, <laughs> it's right, and it doesn't. And yeah. just try different stuff, no matter what. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, two different breweries can have the same recipe and it will taste different. Exactly. Yep. Use the same hops and the same process and the same mm-hmm. whatever, and it'll yeah. still taste different. Yeah. Well, I think there's just too many variables for it to taste the same, right? Mm-hmm. The barrel, the water. the Yeah, the water is the mm-hmm. main thing. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That's uh, my thing with IPAs is like guys that don't like IPAs. I didn't either. Yeah. All right? I didn't either at all. But understanding that every place is going to taste different just keep mm-hmm. trying them because there's yeah. ipas i try now i'm like yeah i won't order that again look yeah. 
I've been so band practice like we switch off on who buys the beer right yeah and 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 usually a case of beer lasts two practices um but i i will always when it's my turn i will always bring ipas i'll bring ipas and then a cheap beer right yeah because i want to make myself better at it oh, mm-hmm. nice. and and i have i think i think i've grown a taste for it and i i'm getting those guys going too because nice. so. when we started this like you wouldn't touch ipa right. no it was tough really? for me yeah but that's cool I, I like how everything's evolved over time that's what I've learned, yeah, with, with mead here, is that it's, nothing is the same. You got to try it. And if you Don't see one scared. of these around, a meadery, go check it out. Because yeah. there are not that many around. Meaderies are pretty rare. And, yeah. I mean, that's why when we were looking at it, when we drove up there, like, we had to go. Hmm. Yeah. It's just I something agree. we had to experience. Hmm. And the atmosphere killed it. Like, the fire and the... I want to go there. I bet. Just because of yeah. how you described that, I want to check yeah. it out. It's hmm. so cool. Everybody's drinking from a horn. I think that was the most <laughs> weird thing I've... Like, you walk into, like, what's supposed to be, like, a bar or something, yeah. right? And everybody's drinking from a horn. <laughs> so cool. It's awesome. I, I completely... Uh, I, I, I totally missed the boat here at the intro. I should have started with, welcome to another episode of A Mead with Atlas. Did not, so... Oh, well, that's okay. But I've learned my lesson. I will end it. Brian, we're not going anywhere for a while. Let's uh, let's finish this mead. <laughs> Thank you for listening to A Beer with Atlas. Special thanks to our brand team for producing the show. Each episode of A Beer with Atlas is powered by Atlas Medstaff, an industry leader in travel healthcare staffing.